You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Good evening. The opinions and statements voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network. Enjoy the shows. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Now historic films made in the spring of 1948 and just released show Enoetok preparing for heavily guarded and still largely secret tests of new atomic weapons. The test's purpose is to measure atomic effects on thousands of different materials, 30,000 tons of them, not as at Bikini to prove military effectiveness. San Francisco police say that nine persons have been arrested in a narcotics raid on the headquarters of the Grateful Dead, a widely popular singing group. Two members of the group, Rod McKernan and Robert Weir, and their business manager, Danny Rifkin, have been booked on suspicion of possessing narcotics. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Well, strange lights are causing a viral buzz on YouTube. Could we have caught extraterrestrial activity on a recent newscast? Brandon Arroyo investigates. As the newscast ended, the controversy began back on September 26th. What is that light shining in the back of the dark night sky? With coverage reaching all the way back to 1948, for over 70 years, Fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Now, Fate Magazine Radio is carrying on that tradition of setting the standard in Paranormal Talk Radio as we report and discuss some of the most mysterious and perplexing phenomena imaginable in this strange world of ours. Now, here is your host of Fate Magazine Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio. Yes, indeed, we are the online voice of Fate Magazine and publication since 1947. I am so excited to be affiliated, and I guess you could say I am the voice of Fate. I love it, and I'm so honored. I have such an exciting guest tonight. And I am telling you that this is something that can go anywhere y'all want it to go. We have both chat rooms open. One is at Spreaker, if you are using a mobile device. The other is at FateMagRadio.com. FateMagRadio.com. And you can also go to the WBHM-DB.com website. And you can sign in and and enter any questions or comments you may have there as well. I just have to say that I am doing this show during the Super Bowl. I understand the angst if you're not watching and trying to keep up with that and listen to the show, but no worries if you should happen to miss a segment. We are everywhere you want to be. iHeart, Spotify, CastBox, Deezer, Oh, goodness. Apple Podcasts, even Podbean, Stitcher, you'll find us. We are there. You can always hit the Spreaker app, and you will find us under WBHM-DB. 
and all of our fabulous shows are listed there. You can grab archives all you want to. And I am so excited. Tonight I get to welcome someone who I've spoken with enough to actually count as my friend. We have discussed things several times. Cheryl Costa is so much more than just an author. Although I will tell you that her UFO sightings desk reference, United States of America 2001 through 2015, should be on the desk of every serious ufologist on the planet. Because there's that much information, you can garner, you know, craft and contacts and everything. And there actually is a setup as you begin the book that explains it to you, discusses the gathering, explains how to use the information. And then you've got numbers, which work magic and educate you. It's a great thing. She is um, the head of Dragon Lady Media, LLC. She is a writer for Wicca Magazine. She is a radio host on KCOR, fantastic network, by the way, of Cosmic Questions. She is a published playwright. It's a series of one-act plays, and it's absolutely wonderful. And I am just really thrilled to be able to welcome you back. And here we are on Fate. Cheryl, Hi. thank you. Hi, how are you? Good I'm to be terrific. here. <laughs> I want you to please do your intro for Cosmic Questions because I think it's fantastic. And I want other <laughs> okay. people to hear it too. Okay. It's not the commentary side of it, just the, just the intro. Yes. Welcome to Cosmic Questions. I'm your host, Cheryl Costa, and I'm a broom-toting, cauldron-stirring, goddess-worshipping witch, and I have been for 40 years. But beyond that, I'm just a parish priestess with a microphone. On this program, we're going to talk about the art, the science, and the lifestyle that is witchcraft and mysticism. The opinions of my radio guests and myself may not necessarily represent every tradition of the craft, but we're going to give you a pretty good snapshot of who we are. So zip back and listen. Hopefully you'll learn something. We are the witches and we have returned, baby. And indeed they have. <laughs> you know, I really was so taken aback, I guess, and interested because I didn't realize that the numbers, that the craft itself as a practice, a faith, whatever you would care to call that, is growing so exponentially. It's oh, just it's taking huge. off gangbusters. It's huge. Um, well, it's been growing for a long time, especially since the 80s and the early women's movement and things like that. It really took off. Um, back in the early 90s, myself and another lady and, and, and then about 80 other pagans, um, I produced the cable television program on witchcraft. We were supposed to do six episodes, and the six episodes uh, managed to garner a um, – uh, a, a small 250, 300-word uh, Associated Press story. And suddenly I get a, I got a phone. We Our show wasn't even on the air yet. It was, we had six shows in a can. That's all I could get a contract for because the, the management of the, uh, the, the uh, cable station was um, uh, paranoid about it. And he said, oh, nobody's going to like this, prog this program. And um, – uh, I got a phone call from them, and they said, uh, can, uh, uh, "Cheryl, did did you know there was a 300 word story out on the on the Associated Press this afternoon? This was May 23rd, 1991." And um, and I said, "Okay, did we get a little bit of press sync?" And this I'm talking to the staff producer at the station. He said, "No, Cheryl. ABC and CBS News are sitting in the lobby, and they want to talk to the witches." <laughs> And we How got fabulous. We got eight to twelve. The station got eight to twelve phone calls a day for the next ten weeks, requesting inter radio interviews, talk show interviews. Larry King had us on. CNN came and visit. Uh, the news came and visited us. Uh, Entertainment Tonight came and visited us during one of our ritual uh, episodes that we did. We had like had sixty, seventy people in the studio, four camera shoot, the whole thing. And uh, that aired on the 5th of July, 1991. And uh, during the, the interview with Entertainment Tonight, when they talked to me, they said, well, what would 
show witchcraft now, modern witchcraft, the way it really is. I said a cross between bewitched and 30 something. And it was not, it was shortly after that broadcast, the people who ended up producing charmed came and talked to us, you know? So, um, we had, we, and ultimately what happened because of all the press and everything, channel 33 turned around and, uh, the president called me in and I thought, well, this is it. They're going to throw us off the air because we're, we're bringing all the, all this, media is raining down upon them and um she throws these two pieces of paper in front of me i thought it was being sued and she says sign them and i said what are they she says they're both 13 week contracts and so i signed them and ultimately we ended up ultimately over the next uh 18 months almost two years we produced uh 70 episodes astounding and, and it was astounding and we were originally uh, we were approached back in back in the day, back in 1991, 1992, and I know some of your audience wasn't even born yet. Okay, <laughs> cable systems in 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 moderate sized cities, and um, we're not talking like New York City, but we're talking you know a principal cities in your state. Um, probably had somewhere between 15 and 20 channels in those days. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I mean when I was in high school, we had five. That was it, you know, and. Um, so uh, new new networks were coming online all the time. And in the late 80s, we had like uh, MTV was a, a major channel, you know. And um, uh, so what happened was they came to me, uh, uh, this predecessor to a particular network that's pretty famous now came to us and said, how would you guys like to take this up to the next level, be on a real network nationwide instead of just on 13, you know, on 13 cable systems in the DC area. And I, yeah, sure. Wow. We could really change the narrative out there on this subject matter. Because again, remember, we're, you know, it's we're, we're what the Catholic church said four or 500 years ago, you know, we're, we're dealing with that narrative. Do you eat babies? Uh, do you practice what you dance with the devil? You know, and there's all these standard questions people ask us and it's rhetoric back from the 14th and 15th century. And of course the Hollywood had ever helped things very much and and so we were changing the narrative because we were coming out there not looking dressed in all black we were coming out there dressed in white puffy collar shirts looking you know kind of like the younger version of the old maids on arsenic and old lace kind of thing you know but we were looking extremely folksy and uh, we were being billed as just a couple of kitchen witches from laurel maryland and that kind of thing and in fact um i believe it was the religious editor for the, the um Wall Street Journal wrote in on our, when we were doing our last program, airing our last program, and he made a comment. He says, I don't know what to think of these program, these programs with the witches, but they have obviously got their message out there. But here's two kitchen witches from Laurel, Maryland, what uh, that have done something very remarkable. They have had the world media eating out of their ham for the past two years and They've been doing it on a $50 a week cable access program. What do they know that the moguls and lawyers and accountants in Hollywood don't? That's real magic. You know, <laughs> something to that That's effect. Is, yes. And about the same time, uh, let's see, October, we were about six months into the program. And I'm not going to go belabor this, but about six program, uh, six months into the program. I get a call from a, 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 a ABC News reporter that uh, that had done a piece on us already. A very famous guy. He's well retired now, but uh, he says to me, "He says, Cheryl, do you know you guys caused a riot in Rome?" Rome? And I'm going, "We caused a riot in Rome? How? You know, we're we're on 13 cable systems here in the Mid Atlantic. You know." He said, "Well, did you you had the equivalent to?" Uh, Italian look and, and Italian people visit you guys, right? And I said, yeah. And he says, okay. And um, you're in Washington, D.C., so the Italian news services picked you up, and they had TV crews come and see, see you, right? I said, yeah, they came to one of our big ceremonies in the studio. He said, okay. That aired on Rome Channel 4 the same week those two magazines hit the street, and it aired on there after uh, in, instead of after the, like the six o'clock news, they did something sort of like a 60 minutes kind of news magazine kind of thing in the seven to eight o'clock hour before prime time. OK, and it all it, it all hit the, the town the same week, Rome in the suburbs. OK, oh my. And 
what happened after it aired, he told me all these women started coming out of their high rise apartments. Uh, the um, cheap, cheap, cheap apartments over there are these high rises. Right. And all these women started coming out into the alleys, marching through the alleys, chanting. And by the time they, they, they ended up at the gates of the Vatican, about 3000 strong chanting in Italian and screaming in Italian, we are the witches. We have returned. That is bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That is bizarre. So all these people are reacting to little old y'all. Yeah. And that's and intense. Our effort was to change the narrative. And okay. You did. And, and we now... did. It, well, well, um, let me go there a moment. Okay. So um, UFO stuff. I got a lot of visibility with UFO stuff, right? And I've been working with a television producer for uh, the last year or so. We're trying to get a UFO program. But you know something? We work with science. And it is hard to sell a show when it's about science and numbers. And you know, numbers bore everybody, you know. So uh, <laughs> it's been slow selling. Although now we've got a couple networks talking to us in earnest. And we may have something here very shortly. But. Back last summer, it, we were very close to signing a contract with one particular network, and it fell apart. But what happened was about a week before – about during the week of that negotiation, uh, my spouse Linda comes to me and says, did you ever vet yourself to our producer um, that you're a card-carrying witch? <laughs> Uh, I said, no, it never came up. He says, she says, well, you know, I don't want this to be success. If you get vetted by the network, that might be a problem. I said, okay. So I dropped him a text. He said, I'll call you up after supper. He calls me up after supper. He's in LA. He calls me up and he says, so what's the deal? And I told him what the, I told him what, what I was and how long I've been doing it. And, and I said, you know, a long time ago, I told you I produced a cable television program. He says, yeah, you did. And he says, um, he says, okay, I don't see it being an issue because you're not going to be the host of the show. And if you were, to, because you're going to be a consulting producer and you're going to be a content expert, uh, if you were the host, they might vet you to nauseam. But he says, I don't see a problem. And if somebody does make a big issue out of it, we'll exploit the snot out of it. You know, I mean, why Again. not? You know, and um, so that was it. About two weeks later, he calls me up one Friday afternoon. So we got to talk about this craft stuff. I said, oh, you know, and he says, hey. My staff did some research and found out there's a whole bunch of networks around the uh, uh, around the world that are looking for programming like this. Would you would you be willing to do a program like this again? And I said, okay. Um, I said, okay. Two rules. He says, what's that? I said, one, we're not going to do a creepy reality show. He's okay. And I said, and you're not going to have us dye our hair black and wear a lot of black eyeliner and dress up like a bunch of goths. That's not who we are. If you do a smart, if we do a smart show like Ancient Aliens or uh, Nova, the people I know and the people they know, we can open doors all over the world to all 60 or 100 different tradi major traditions that are out there. And we will be able to give you an eyeball into real magic and mysticism that nobody else ever has. And he said, Done. <laughs> so it sat on the back burner in development. Uh, the television development moves at the speed of drunk snails. <laughs> uh, people think all this stuff just falls that. out of the sky. People think it falls out of the sky, but no real, real television development takes time. They have to learn. They have to figure out how to pitch it. They have to feel out the networks for what mm -hmm. they're looking for. And then there's the pitching efforts and they go to these uh, conventions called real, real R E E L screen. It's uh, where produce independent, uh, well, even per major producer producers go to the acquisition executives for all these networks and stream now these days streaming networks and all this kind of stuff and pitch their wares it's at a, it's a convention where you get access to these people and um this guy goes to them all he goes to all three of these events and uh, he went 
to pitch his own normal stuff that he does the, in his normal stock and trade for what they do in their production company, which is very scientific stuff. And then he also has been pitching the UFO stuff. He's got well, at one point with nine different networks and it's down to two very serious network. And if I told you who they were, you'd you'd absolutely know who they are. OK, I uh, and got I, it. I'm under an NDA, so I can't uh, non-disclosure agreement. I can't tell you who we're talking to. Um, in fact, he well, just told me after the Christmas break, and you know, we, we got to go to break, don't we? We do. But I can't wait because this is a cliffhanger. It's a great place to go to break. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, hang loose. I promise we're going to get to the UFOlogy. But isn't this interesting? So we will be back with you, and thank you. Catch you on the flip side. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Several U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say to you, still think it's a meteor, Professor. I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's Capital Account. UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am joined by my guest, And I just can't even tell you how excited I am to have Cheryl Costa here with me tonight. We have been talking all kinds of things, and we started off with witchcraft because a temple has just been opened, and she is the, is it the head priestess? High priestess. And it's pretty fascinating stuff, and it's a big, big deal that they were able to open this, and it's just really terrific. But Sherry has some questions for you. Okay. And I'm going to just read them all to you. And you can just kind of consolidate. Okay. If you you want to do it that way, whatever you want. Well, because some of them would be yes or no's if I didn't. Okay. 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 So you're really a real witch. What type? Do you actually practice witchcraft? 
What did you have to study? What did you have to do to study to become one? Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Yes, I am a card-carrying witch. Um, uh, in fact, be, I, I, I said that the other day someplace, and somebody said, you're really a card-carrying witch? And I said, would you like one? You know? <laughs> And there's this big black card that comes out of my wallet. Uh, it's got magic in in a, a 50 point type on it, and then priestess at cherylcosta.com written across it. No phone number, nothing. Just that's it, you know. And um, that's all it has to be. Yeah, I uh, I was in the Navy, and uh, I was raised Catholic, like many pagans and Wiccans. And when I was in the Navy, I was exposed, this is, we're talking in the um, early mid seventies, I was exposed to a couple of sailors who were um, early Gardnerian uh, pra craft practitioners in that time. Um, I resonated with it. And uh, on my ship, there turned out to be, not that everybody went around advertising it, but we found each other. And there were about eight of us. And um, uh, that was my connection, and literally about a year into it, in the North Atlantic, up in the forward diesel, they initiated me. You know, so you know it was a very private place and a very not travel area of the ship. And um, I was a solitary practitioner until about the uh, very early '80s, and then a friend of mine handed me a copy of um, *Spiral Dance* by Starhawk. I recommend the book. Uh, it's a very good grounding in goddess faith, and it's a very good grounding in fairy tradition. And uh, so uh, the person who gave it to me, I met at a psychic fair. And I was I was a reader at one of the psychic fairs. And that got a dialogue going with several other people who were readers and turned it out. Uh, we, a whole bunch of us got snowed in one weekend in Scranton, Pennsylvania. There was this massive st ice storm and uh, it just completely killed the the. the the psychic fair, the streets, we couldn't drive home. We were only an hour drive from home in Binghamton, New York at the time, but the streets looked like they'd been decoupaged. It was, it, the, wow. the ice storm was that bad. Just everything was glazed. In fact, walking to the hotel was um, flirting with death. It really was. Um, and we were all kind of, we all had adjoining rooms and um, we found this very inexpensive hotel and uh, we started Oh, I started talking. One thing led to another over a couple of pizzas. And the next thing you know, we uh, all the witches ended up in one room congregated talking witchcraft stuff. And um, and that's where I made some of my first what I'm going to call group friends. And about a month later, I was invited to a group circle. It was my first one. Scared the living snot out of me to go there. I did not know what to expect. I know what I had been studying, but I did not know what to expect in this group circle. But it was a very, very warm experience. And one of the priestesses that was there, a very senior priestess, she was not the high priestess, but she was a senior priestess. And she, she held my hand through the whole thing to give me confidence to stay there. And at the end of the thing, she said, if I give you a pentacle, would you, uh, a pentagram, would you wear it? And I said, yes, I will. And she pulled off a ring off her finger and stuck it on mine. And wow. uh, it, it stayed there right up there till about, uh, till about 20 years ago. And I had a, I had a bit of an, a, I had a bit of an accident and the, um, the, the guy in the emergency room had to cut it off, you know, because my finger was swelling up, you know, oh, and, dear. um, yeah, I, I something very heavy got dropped on my hand and uh, it messed my hand up kind of bad at the time. So, uh, yes, I've been doing that. I back through the 80s, I taught classes down in the D.C. area. Um, I it was a pretty well-known, uh, very flexible priestess. Because a lot of people who do this, uh, people think that covens and circles are the rule and they're not solitary. Everybody's a solitary practitioner in their own personal practice. OK, everybody, even the people in covens do their own practice, probably as solitaries. Then if you get together with people who are kind of loosely affiliated, uh, that's a gaggle. You know, that's a, a handful of people who get together occasionally because they happen to know that everybody's uh, into craft or paganism or something like that. And then if it starts getting a little more formalized where there's like a formal a, a formal phone tree and maybe one person, we all start gathering at her or his house on a regular basis, that be, we can probably call a circle. And that's what most gathering groups are, circles. Now, when you start talking about covens, Covens are very private. If you want to use the word secret, that works too. 
Um, and what they do is they might go out and teach public free public classes on craft down at one of these free university kind of places downtown. You see these things advertised in the free papers and things, okay? And they use that as like an outer ring sort of recruiting kind of thing, okay? And as they see people they like, who've got potential, and they resonate and everything like this, they might invent them, invite them into another outer circle where they can kind of like a firm team and keep an eye on them and the thing before before they're ever invited into the inner circle, as they say. Um, I've had over the years uh, about half a dozen covens uh, get me into that outer circle, okay? And um, as a pre- as somebody who's been around, okay, um, I'm turned down. I, I was turned down six times, four times because they felt I was too much of a wild duck, okay? I and I am. That. I am very much a wild duck. I'm a free yeah. thinker, and I, I approach, and when it comes to magic, I am a utilitarian. I practice what works, not what, not what the um, script of some, some white guy's book says it is, okay? okay. And, uh, and I say it that way because I, I know a lot of people complain about the fact that a, a lot of the early books were published by a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, dead white guys, as they say. You know? And so I practice magic for the things that I know work. Okay. In fact, uh, recently, I, uh, it's about the third time I've taught this. Uh, I taught a major advan- a basic and inv- advanced magical physics class. No gods and goddesses. Okay. No spells. I taught it like a, f- a high school or a college physics class and say, magic is nothing more than very advanced physics. And let me show you how it works and I'll teach you the basics. And the class is well attended and blew their bloody socks off it always does but okay let's go back to craft the covens okay so the cover and then then there was other two other covens that considered having me and then remember that little television program i had back in 1991 1992 and i had all that visibility larry king had me and the host on entertainment tonight you name it everybody but the soviets and the chinese came to interview us okay that's just uh, so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we got pictures of the host in in the uh, Japanese equivalent, the People magazine. You know, there's her picture there, sitting behind her all her stage altar, and uh, everything's in vertical rows in Chinese or Japanese. You know, so the bottom line was, uh, those two covens said, "You're much too visible for us. We don't want to be caught dead with you in a restaurant or on the street because." You're a witch. Everybody knows you're a witch. Half of America saw you on Larry King. We don't want guilt by association. We're private. (laughs) Guilt by association said they're ashamed to be witches? No, they're stealth. And one thing we learned about the program was we learned the people who were happy to come out, and we also learned about the portion of the community that was very happily stealth. Hmm. Okay. Now, I had a situation where I was, you know, people say, well, wow, when you came out, was it a problem? Yeah. Yeah. When our television show hit the street and we started getting newspaper articles in the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times and you, and everybody out on the on the net. Yes. Kestrel and I found ourselves being followed around by five different police agencies at every level of government. OK, particularly me, because I had a I had a top security clearance working for a major aerospace company. OK, yeah. um, but. Basically, my being out actually protected my clearance because I couldn't be blackmailed. You can't go on entertainment at the night and say, hey, I'm a card carrying Alexandrian witch, you know. And uh, people ask me what I practice these days. Well, I practice uh, – if you ask me tradition-wise, what am I ordained in? Let's say it that way. Uh, I'm an ordained third-degree Alex- Alexandrian priestess, and I'm not Alexandrian. It's Alexander's in. Alexandrian, okay, Alexander's tradition. Um, no, so far from that tradition, it's ridiculous, but I'm ordained in it. Uh, I'm an ordained third degree priestess in an Icenian tradition. What does that Icenian mean? Um, the goddess Isis is my primary, is one of my principal goddesses, and the whole Egyptian pantheon of thirteen of uh, fifteen hundred and three go- ancient gods are my pals, okay. I lived in a Buddhist monastery for seven years. I was an ordained Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist nun in the Tibetan Orthodox tradition for seven years. And I hold uh, I hold an ordination as a Buddhist yogi. I hate to say that, but you people think of Buddhist yogis as some guy with long hair sitting on a mountain someplace. Um, there's a whole bunch of us. And what's really neat about our temple that we just started, the guy who's my high priest 
you know, uh, he's our ritual director and, and, and a high, pri- a high priest. He's ordained in the same Orthodox tradition of Tibetan uh, Buddhist shamanism that I am. So we're in the same lineage. So this temple has the special magic of two Tibetan yogis leading the ritual and driving the organization. Everybody around us is saying, there's, 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 there's a, you know, lightning's going to hit the spot right now, kind of thing. You know, this is something very special going on here. So, well, it sounds like it's preordained. Ah, uh, you know, anybody who does the craft long enough, if you've dedicated yourself to one of the goddesses, you find yourself in a situation where you might get these slack periods where you. You know, really not a lot going on, you know, and then maybe one day suddenly she's throwing students out of the woodwork at you. Okay, I moved to the middle of the Bible Belt on a corporate transfer back in 86. Okay, and my spouse and I were both Wiccan and uh, we we thought, well, that's it. You know, we're going down to the Bible Belt. It won't be safe to do anything. But we, we still wore our little pinnacle rings. You know, those little uh, pen, mm-hmm. pentagram rings. And I, you'd be in the mall, you know, at the nail shop, or you'd be in there shopping for shoes and be cashing out at the credit card station or something like this. And someone would lean into you and say, I like your pentagram. Oh, um, do you have a circle? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the next thing you know, we had enough people to form a circle in a period of about two months after moving there just because we wore our ring publicly. That is so bizarre and cool. And the name, the, the apartment complex we were in that, at that time, the place was called Coverstone Hill Circle. That was the name of the apartment complex. And, and my ex and I thought about it one day. He says, what a beautiful cover for it. You know, it, you know, it's the same address name as the address, you know, so we just called ourselves that. Uh, I've had, we've had other kinds of circles. I had one, we had one called, uh, I had one called the Magic Oven Coven. Okay, and we did our magic through baking bread and and we did ceremonial bread making and we would have like a a meditation session while we're sitting here making and making our working our dough and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes you want to mix the dry goods. We'd go into the front room with these big, big bowls under our arm with big wooden spoon and we would mix the, 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 the dry goods for bread making while dancing to belly dancing music. Very powerful. Boy, those loaves. You want to see loaves that rise up very golden, <laughs> robust, you know. Uh, so uh, th- we've done a lot of cool things. I'm really big into sacred theater. Not a lot of people are. But, you know, when you go back to our ancient roots in in, in uh, Greece, the ancient Greek god Dionysus is considered the god of theater, not because he was a you know the the patron of theater, but because he was the patron of of um, wine making and wine growing, and because that was a mystery how these grapes turned into wine, kind of thing. Okay, and um, so he was considered almost like a fertility god, but because all the ancient Greek ceremonies to honor Dionysus and the and the fertility of spring and winemaking and all this stuff became great festivals and great passion sacred passion plays he is he was the root of western theater and that's universally recognized now you get away from the west european and like that you go to asia africa Almost every form of theater on the planet is rooted probably in their ancient uh, Vedic, tribal, or shamanic traditions. It is a very common thing, okay? Um, And these plays right up until uh, colonial times were probably – were all rooted in these shamanic and tribal traditions. And then uh, they began getting more modernized and things. And what what do we have now? We have movies. We have plays. And it's all run by big money. And anything that's even sacred never makes it to Broadway, never makes it into the movies because it's all about money. So there are those of us right now with this temple. Hey, I own a temple now. (laughs) We're going to have some sacred theater in our temple during our moons, uh, during our moon practices. And I've got about half a dozen plays that are perfectly suitable for teaching modern version themes, modern themes that represent 
ancient themes that we teach in paganism. Well, I have more questions. Please, anything. Okay. Anything, anything, I will tell you anything short of my ATM pin. Uh, <laughs> nah, don't need that, but that's okay. Um, well, yeah, you know, unless you just have a generous moment come across you, and then I still don't need the number, you can just take care of that. I'm retired. I'm poor. I'm poor as a church mouse. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I do understand. Okay. Now, this may be personal. This may not be. Ask. Uh, but you told me to ask anyway. So, can you give examples of what type of magic spells you do personally? Like, do you? <laughs> Sherry's so cute. Okay. Like, do you okay. ever put a whammy on someone you get mad at, or you, do you do no. like good luck witchcraft? She's confused at what witches do because this okay. is all new to her. Okay, let's let's go this way. Um, and you only have wrote, three minutes, but you can. Do I know. This. Okay, a real quick story. Uh, I, I one of the first articles I wrote for Wicca magazine about a year ago was, "Are we teaching witchcraft all wrong?" Okay, and we start people out with spells, and the real thing we need to be starting them out with is meditation because magic works on the idea of connecting to communicating with your younger self which is that subconscious primal part of you that's connected to all that is it's connected to the force so to speak the god forces out there in the universe and it sounds like obi-wan kenobi permeates everything all through the universes okay and um we don't teach people that we teach them spellcraft and what do spells do? Spells are intended to cause visualization in your mind and because the only way you can communicate with your younger self is with song, shadow play, pictures, and um, vis strong visualization. And in our Western culture, we have chatter, what we call monkey chatter minds. OK, right. so yes. and I tell my students, I tell my students, if, if I have if I have a class going, the first thing I tell them, uh, leave your uh, either turn your phones off, not muted, turn your phones off or lock them up in the car. You do not become a Jedi Knight with a cell phone in your hand. That would be absolutely true because it's so completely. It numbs you. Yeah, and people think I'm a hard ass because I say this, but it's it goes down to the mystical thing of learning to quiet your mind so that you can communicate something. But if you've got all kinds of chatter going on in your mind, and all of us here in the West have an exposure to that kind of thing, especially the younger folks who are just like living on these phones, um, that's it, it. The chatter it, we call it monkey chatter in Buddhism, and uh, they uh, if you don't learn to quiet your mind then uh, practicing magic can be hindered and spellcraft is not the way to start. I tell people uh, don't start with spell books. Um, it's better. You'd be better off to take a class on meditation. It, it will get you on a better path. And I can suggest a couple of books uh, to, to, to read a couple of authors you might want to read if you want to learn about craft. Okay. And so since we have 10 seconds, we're going to nip this right here mm -hmm. and be right back. So, We'll see y'all on the flip side. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern 
on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, and I am joined by Cheryl Costa, and we are having a very fascinating discussion. I am... I was anticipating ufology. We are going to be discussing that. We're discussing her pagan practices and the witchcraft that is involved with that as well. And we were talking during the break. If you could describe something about how you practice. Okay. Okay, let's go to one basic rule about craft. Yes, you go on Facebook, you will meet tons of excuse me, tons of witches who will say, I don't believe in karma and we don't believe in, in the threefold rule. That's a Wiccan thing they'll say to you. Okay. All right. Well, I, I tell people uh, regarding the threefold rule, if you believe that, fine, do so at your own risk. Okay. Um, karma is a very real thing and it can affect the quality of any kind of a magical working, working you do. OK, if something is not supposed to happen right now, it won't. If karma drives that sort of thing, everything in its own time and season, as they say. OK, the other thing people say, well, can you put a whammy on somebody? I said, yeah, I could put a whammy on them, but I don't. And they said, well, why not? I said, one, what gives you the right to be judge, jury and executioner or punisher? OK, how do you know what the whole situation is? Okay, get your damn ego out of it. Magic is best done when you take your bloody ego out of it. Okay. The other thing I learned a long time ago, there is blowback. There is blowback. Okay. And so you send bad things out. Some percentage of that bad thing comes back. If it's completely unjustified, it comes back very heavy. Okay. Okay. Now, so people say, well, what kind of magic do you do? Okay, you want to know what I learned in the, studying with the Far Eastern Masters? It's a thing called raising the great bodhicitta. In fact, I'm teaching a class on it this Tuesday night. The great what? The great bodhicitta. Now, cheetah, hear that term. That's a Sanskrit term. It means to breathe. It also means to be quiet and breathe. Okay, and what it really the Bodhi part of it is a, a bigger connection to things. Okay, kind of like a karmic connection. You're mm -hmm. you all of you and I have a connection karmically now because we've been talking like this. Uh, there's people I've known for years. We have a karmic connection. Okay, everyone has a karmic connect, and and everyone theoretically is karmically connected to every living thing or every living thing in the multiverse. Okay. Because we're all connected through the force. The, what, if you want to call it the God force, whatever, uh, let's use the star Wars terminology. We're all connected via the force. Right. And that, that little bit of life spark that we contain in us is our spark of the force. It is not separate from the force. It is a drop of water walking through an ocean. Okay, and our physical meat sock, this flesh body chicken suit that we wear in this lifetime, who are we really? We, I am the, I am the immortal being behind this mask of flesh that's had a million lifetimes. I've been known by a gazillion names, yet I have none. That's who I am. Okay, mm -hmm. now. Magic. What's bodhicitta? Bodhicitta tra basically translates in this Buddhist concept as raising the great generosity. Okay. So I used to sit in a lot of circles. 
uh, moon circles, particularly things like this. And there'd be 25, 30 people sitting in this public moon circle at some lady's house and maybe our backyard or something like that. And what would happen is they would, um, she'd go around and all these people would say, does anybody have any special intentions? And there'd be some, well, my cat's got to have a uh, hip surgery next week. And then the next person, oh, my aunt's on uh, chemotherapy right now. I want to do it. And it goes around like this for all these people for 25, 30 minutes, spooning out the magic by the spoonful. We're talking about the most awesome, most omnipotent force in the in the universes, and they're spooning it out by the spoonful. Got to me finally, and I had had enough of listening to this, and I said, I want to make this offering of this circle and, and this celebration for all beings everywhere, every when. And it brought the room to a screeching halt. I was just going to say that had to be a like. So. Yeah, it was. So, so what does that mean? Well, in terms of if as a witch, if I do a practice, I do a practice of raising a great generosity. I, I don't I don't think about whammies. I don't care about whammies. I raise the benefit is I want everybody everywhere, everyone to have a really fantastic day. And I do my working for that. Right. Now, guess what? It's a positive spell. And it's a big positive spell. And as Wang Lama used to say, think big, think really big with your visualization and think really big with your offerings. You don't have a big offering. Visualize a, a pile of offerings the size of Mount Everest and offer that. And I said, but that's not real. Did you visualize it? Did it not become a separate little universe out here because you visualize it? I said, yeah, you can offer it. Okay. So you make this big offering for everybody, everywhere, every win. And guess what? Remember that blowback factor we talked that blowback factor is so lovely. Yes. Positivity. You don't yields need positivity. to do dark magic. People who do dark magic, in my view, are are very demented narcissists. Now, do I do attack magic? I do not do attack magic. I have over the years, over 30, 40 years, I have wrapped myself in protective spells. You start to term shields, you know, okay? Right. And I yeah. wrap myself in protective smells, spells. And the running commentary with my my mother who doesn't talk to me anymore is everybody who ever beat her up in school's dead. There okay? Did I go after them? No. Enter my space at your own risk with your ill intent. I can't help it if you come in here um, uh, trying to throw a whammy on me. I can't help it if you if it rebounds on you and flattens you. That's the risk you take. I've wrapped myself in protective spells for 30 years. That's how it works. Let's just send everybody a nice day. Yes. What's so hard about that? Be generous. And everybody I've taught this magic concept to of just practicing generosity take yourself out of the equation take me out of the equation take yourself out of the equation it's not about you hoping for something or wishing for something too many people practice magic thinking it's a big, big bloody vending machine for everything you want don't give it to everybody else give them what they want what they need okay and the blowback suddenly your life seems to get nicer and the well, things and you need in life seem to fill you yeah it fills you yes heck jesus taught that bloody stuff you know so yep. i mean just, just be kind to your neighbor you know love thy neighbor as thyself that should be the mantra of witches it really should be people say witches heal yeah love thy neighbor as thyself that's the deal Yep. And if you do positive magic, good things will come back to you. Don't be a judge, jury, and executioner and figure you have to take out the guy down the street who beat up that kid or uh, take out the guy down the street that everybody doesn't like. I know some women who did that. Eight of them got together. They did this spell on this guy because he hit on all of them. And they thought he was a slime ball and everything. Actually, he was a very nice man. And guess what? 
it rebounded on them. Every one of them. Here's thir- here we are 30 years later. Every one of them is a spinster. Amazing, okay? right? Yeah. Funny how that's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I have another question. Anything and anything your fans want to ask, I will have. Oh, and by the way, you did ask me the question about a book. Okay, if you're just breaking into this and you want to study craft, and I know it might sound silly, I'm going to point you at two books. Spiral Dance, for one, to get kind of get the ethics and the flavor of the seasons, goddess worship, that kind of thing. The other book is Silver Raven Wolf's Teen Witch. Now, even if you're an adult, Teen Witch is a good book to cut your teeth on because she cuts it right down to the essentials. In fact, I use it very frequent, frequently with adult with, uh, adult first-timers. Uh, it's a good book because she cuts right to the chase of the thing. And I know Silver very well. I've known her for 35 years. A very, very, very wonderful parish priestess. Terrific. And Your I, question. I will put those on the page as well. And, Please. you know, the question is, what are the different types of witches? She says she's heard of white witches, but she's sure there are others. Okay, look, I, th- th- this goes into that thing of white witches, gray witches, black witches, you know. Okay, come on. It's Is not there about. Lo- yeah, it, it's about this. Uh, okay, there's two levels where you really look at this thing. People say, Is it all oh, black magic? <laughs> magic is neutral. What's white, black, or gray about it is the ethics of the person driving it. Mm-hmm. Okay? And that's it. It's the ethics of the person driving it, not the particular type of magic. Do you know that black magic in this country is a $4 billion industry? Yes. You know, and, and that's that's insane. But the bottom line is posit- white, a white witch is po- people who do positive work, positive positive practices help the help heal people help people change their circumstances things like that okay and you know i i I don't know how many people have called me up if they've heard me on the radio or saw me on television something like that they think we wiggle our nose and supper appears and that is not the case larry king asked me in uh, june 6 1991 um do you throw whammies on people and i looked at him i said no larry it's too much work and they're not worth it there you go they're not worth I'm not, I'm better than that and I don't need the blowback from from that slang ball. Well, I bet you didn't exactly. expect to hear this kind of a conversation, but Well, I'm gonna tell you that things work out the way they're meant to. Mm-hmm. And I think that yeah, you know, because I came into this ready for the UFOlogy discussion. Yeah. And then I saw your your facebook post about the temple opening yeah and i thought how fabulous because it's a much better conversation believe me you've already got a lot of text about the thing and like i said i'll answer any questions they want so if you want to go in the next hour and keep this going i'm on a roll with you hon (laughs) well we will do that but you know i just am so fascinated by the by the turn that things take sometimes Mm-hmm. And I'm cool with this because this is something I'm sure that we were meant to discuss. I am always Honey, open there is to a the bigger hand. At, there is a bigger hand. This weekend has been the weekend of the bigger hand at work here. Trust me. Yeah. Well, I mean, because you know, and I know that I love your book. <laughs> so, and I do think that that is something that everybody interested in ufology who's going to be a serious researcher should follow. I heard and something this afternoon. Tell me. Uh, I did a UFO. Uh, we're, we're going to or go to break. When we come back for break, ask me about Megacon and the lady that I extended protection of over. I will, because that was a great conference. Yeah, it was. So we will be back. We've, Well, actually, we've got about a minute, but you know, by the time I finish running my mouth about this, it will be break time. (laughs) I've got I've got a book coming out probably in the next two months. It's called uh, uh, Lady Tashi. That's that's my craft name. Lady Tashi's Little Book of Magic. And the first one is 21 Lessons for New Witchcraft Students. Well, there you go. And we will post that before we get out of here. So 
we will be back. And you know, this is our news break. This is a, a five minute or so break. It's a great time to stretch your legs. Um, potty break, potty break. <laughs> that too. Refill your beverage. And we are Fate Mag Radio. And you know what? Maybe we'll find a little good news tonight. What do you think? It's always worth looking for. And you know what? If you don't look, you won't find. Catch you on the flip side. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Almond Board of California. Almond farmers rely on healthy honeybees, so they've funded more than 100 research projects supporting bee health more than any other crop group. More at almondsustainability.org. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Janine Herbst. A second case of the coronavirus has been detected in California, and that brings the number of confirmed cases in the U.S. to nine, with four in California. Santa Clara County health officials say a woman who traveled to Wuhan, China, developed symptoms but hasn't been sick enough to be hospitalized and has been regularly monitored. This case is unrelated to the first case in that county. Health officials say that means there is no person-to-person spread of the virus in Santa Clara County so far. And in France, a second French chartered plane carrying more than 250 evacuees from China has landed. And Pierre's Eleanor Beardsley reports officials say none of the passengers had symptoms of the coronavirus when they left Wuhan. The giant Airbus A380 landed Sunday at a military base in southern France. On board were people from 30 nations, French, Belgians, Dutch, Danes, Czechs, Slovaks, and some African citizens, all desperate to flee the epicenter of the crisis. Authorities haven't said if the returnees would be put into quarantine, but 200 French nationals who returned on a flight Friday were put in isolation for 14 days. The French foreign minister says the non-French citizens will be able to return to their home countries. Jean-Yves Le Drian also hailed what he called excellent cooperation with Chinese authorities in getting foreigners out. Eleanor Beardsley, NPR News, Paris. Pete Buttigieg wrapped up his final Iowa rally before tomorrow's caucuses, asking a crowd of more than 2,000 to imagine waking up on the first day that Donald Trump is no longer president. NPR's Don Gagne reports. Buttigieg was on stage in a domed high school basketball arena in Des Moines, urging a noisy audience to think about life after Trump. Are we ready to say goodbye to the chaos and the corruption? Are we ready to say goodbye to the cruelty and the division? Recent polls have consistently put Buttigieg among the leading Democratic contenders in Iowa. This weekend, he held 11 events at venues large and small all over the state. Don Gagne, NPR News, Des Moines. President Trump will give his State of the Union address Tuesday night in the Capitol, where his impeachment trial is still underway. He's expected to declare that the State of the Union is strong, even when it's bitterly divided, as he asks Americans for a second term. Trump is the third president in U.S. history to be impeached, but he is expected to be acquitted in his Senate trial on Wednesday. Both sides will give closing arguments tomorrow. Then on Wednesday, senators will vote on whether to acquit him or remove him from office. Super Bowl 54 is underway at the Hard Rock Stadium in Miami with the Kansas City Chiefs playing the San Francisco 49ers. It's the first time these two teams have faced off in a Super Bowl. The score at last check, 3-0, 49ers. You're listening to NPR News from Washington. Eritrea is denouncing the Trump administration for adding the country to a security travel ban list, which now imposes restrictions on an estimated one quarter of the African population. And here's Ada Peralta reports, it's not because the country wants its citizens to travel freely, but because officials say it's not friendly. The government of Eritrea says it has lobbied many countries to stop giving asylum to its citizens. Eritrea, which is one of the most authoritarian countries in the world, has lost about 10% of its population in recent years. So the travel ban, the government says, really suits their needs. But it has nothing to do with stemming emigration out of Eritrea. Instead, the Ministry of Information said in the statement, it, quote, singles out Eritrea without justification. And because of that, the government is dismayed with, quote, this unfriendly act. The Trump administration says the bans are to ensure national security, but critics have called them racist and xenophobic. Ada Peralta, NPR News, Nairobi. 
Officials say a student privacy law will complicate the Census Bureau's ability to get full information about students living in college-run housing in the once-a-decade headcount. The Department of Education is warning colleges and universities that the law prevents schools from releasing students' sex, race, or Hispanic origin. And if a student opted out of releasing personal details, those schools can't release any information about them. Asian markets are trading lower at this hour. The Asia Dow is down nine-tenths of a percent. I'm Janine Herbst, NPR News in Washington. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am so glad that you are here with us. And we have preempted our UFOlogy topic to go with Cheryl's pagan experience and knowledge. And you know what? I'm a firm believer in everything happens the way it's supposed to. And we are just rolling with this flow. Pretty much interesting. And I'm pretty much fascinated. I know that the people in chat are having a great learning opportunity. So if you would like to get over in our chat rooms, please do so. We can get your questions and Cheryl is answering them right up the, you know, right down the line. You can find our chat either at fatemagradio.com, wbhm-db.com, or you can find us in Spreaker under whm-db, and you can look for Fate Mag Radio, and we're there. You can also hit that little heart and like us and you'll be notified when we're going live and all that other good stuff they tell me. So it's a, we're always different, never boring, <laughs> and we just roll with what the universe sends us. So I am having a great time, Cheryl. Thank you so much for being so open with these experiences and with your answers to the questions. Okay. I have one chat room with people who are knowledgeable on the topic. I have one chat room with someone who has absolutely never had the first discussion relevant to this. Mm -hmm. So to me, I just find it fascinating. I love learning things and you're mm -hmm. really good at teaching no matter what the topic. So well, can I pass along one of the most common questions I get asked like on Facebook and things like this mm -hmm. is um, how do I find a goddess or a god or a goddess? Right. right. And, and I, I've seen people, do two things. Uh, I've seen people having the conversation in some of the chat rooms say, oh, I'm thinking about going Celtic. Why? You know? Okay, a lot of the modern witchcraft books, especially from the 70s and early 80s, have a tendency to lean towards Celtic, Celto-European Celto European type of things. But, and I, I was sucked into that as well. You know, I started out sort of quasi -gard gardenarian Alexandrian, that type of thing. They were basically parallel traditions. And uh, I, I invoked, you know, uh, the the Greek pantheon, I Celtic gods, Bridget, uh, you know, we love you, Bridget. Oh, yes, we do, you know. And, um, uh, but what surprised me, and I have no prejudice not to call certain gods. I, somebody asked me uh, recently, I, I, I am a journalist, so I had somebody ask me recently, he was a journalist, he said, well, do you people have a god? And I looked at him, I said, hey, hon, we got gods by the bushel. I you saw know? that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's true. Um, I was asked to write an article about, Astar, uh, about Astara, okay, that's uh, 21st, 22nd, you know, of, of March. And um, uh, I decided to do some additional research and I identified 225 deities that, you know, uh, resonate to the, that spring fertility aspect equivalent to a star. Okay. And wow. where the, the term where, uh, you know, of course, you know, the Christian community steals all our stuff as everybody knows. So where did Easter come from? And of course it's watered down to bunny rabbits uh, are fertile and uh, chicken eggs. All right. You know, uh, but it, uh, a star 20, uh, that, that whole 
March equinox type of thing, uh, is um, it, it's a fertility rite. You know, you go to Japan. If you were to get a Japanese channel, you'd be see see guys carrying a big thing on uh, you know ten or twelve guys, six guys, five or six guys on each side carrying uh, a thing that looks like you know something like you'd carry an emperor on type of thing, and it's a penis. This it's a penis the size of a, a Volkswagen up there. You know, and um, uh, well, they do it up. Ambitious. It's it's it, you go to Japan. I lived in Japan. I saw this stuff, and they did it around certain sh- uh, Shinto uh, sh- um, Shinto um, temples. Now Shinto, when people and the Wiccans out there hear this, sh- Shinto in Japan is very similar. It's the Kami God uh, pantheon, and it's very similar to. Um, the, the visual form of it is, isn't is similar, but the actual, when you start looking at the Pantheon, it's not all that different than what we teach in Wicca. Okay. 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 okay so that's one thing to keep in mind. Now in Japan, if they do a census and they ask people what they are, they say, I'm Buddhist and I'm Shinto. Now people say, well, how can you be that? Well, I'm Buddhist and I'm Mycenaean and I'm, uh, and I'm Wiccan. And people say, well, how can you do that? Well, the 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 Asinian and the Wicca are my gods and goddesses side of my philosophy, and the Buddhism Buddhism is my um, personal uh, settling and moral compass. Okay. Right. And and that's what we don't have a lot of in American witchcraft is you know again our whole cultures that whole Scrooge mentality me 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 and make money make do this give me this give me that oh oh gods please give me a new bicycle you know it's it's all that kind of stuff um i tell people as far as finding god or goddess you've been alive many millions of lifetimes many thousands of lifetimes and we all have some society or culture on the planet that we resonate with okay and I didn't know I resonated with the Egyptians. I had no clue that I did until one day in the late 80s, I was working with a priestess who happened to be an Iceanian priestess, and we were working on something in her home for a festival. And I got looking, well, you know, she was in the restroom. I'm looking at her library, and I said, I'm fascinated with some of these books. So I get looking at some stuff, and stuff started resonating with me. And wouldn't you know, the, the, um, uh, various goddesses within the Egyptian pantheon began resonating with me. And they are in, and once you really establish a relationship with a particular pantheon, they visit you um, rather regularly, especially if you're, you've got a high degree of reverence towards them. And that is that is an amazing experience. Um, I know a particular organization that does the Greek Pantheon, and they have a they have a, a spring mysteries every year, and they've got people there who literally channel the gods, and it's quite impressive. And uh, so it's it's very spe- it's a, it's a very special thing. Yes, people do channel these things. I'm not saying go out there and meditate and open yourself up to any 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 spirit who decides he wants to say I can give you this, you know. Don't don't do that. That's how you get possessed. Possession yes, it is, is a very possession is a very real thing. Yes, but it is. when you're working with the gods, it's considerably more gentle. And it is it is not where they take you over. They just let us say they kind of speak through you. It's a it's a very different kind of thing. And um, I'll tell you, I was at a board me- meeting for the temple last week, and during a particular I don't want to call it an argument, but during a very heated debate on one thing, suddenly my eyes closed and I lost two minutes. And what I found out afterwards, they were recording, uh, they were recording on somebody's iPhone, the, the, the narrative of our, of our meeting instead of having a, a secretary take notes. And, uh, I channeled Hathor. She's an Egyptian goddess. I channeled her for two minutes and she gave them her opinion, you know? Um, but I've been at this a while, you know, they, they know I'm an open phone line. So, <laughs> you know, that well, kind of that- but that's fascinating because I am I am always very careful not to let myself be that open. So what would you I don't know, it's just a mindset perhaps or an educational base. 
Well, we're taught not to not to open ourselves up like that. And I teach everybody don't open yourself up like that. It's a, it's 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 a pat. I know a lot of people who have done it and they do it on the idea, oh, they'll make me special and oh, they'll give me they promise me power. It's that whole thing of playing like with the Ouija boards and stuff like that. No, 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 no. That's that's a bad thing to do. Yes, uh, it there's is. a there's a lot of malevolent spirits out there. Trust me. But when you're dealing with the gods, it's a, it's not like you pray to them a couple of times and they come to you. No, it, it, you're dealing, we're talking long-term exposure here of veneration with certain gods and goddesses, okay? So it's relationship-based. It, it, it's a relationship. And, you know, one of the one of the things, a couple of my priestess friends and I, um, these these are from other traditions. We, a whole bunch of them got, to, a bunch of us got together for coffee one day and we're talking. And, you know, one of the commentaries that came out of it is just, you know, our Christian friends, um, God fearing and on their knees. And I said, uh, our tradition seems to be like, it's like a, a, a mother and child relationship with our gods, with our goddesses. You know, uh, I talked to a priest and he says, it's kind of like having a father again. You know, it, it was, it, it was, you know, in my case, uh, a couple of these different, um, uh, goddesses are touching me and when you really boil it down to get the god force okay let's go down that route a minute you got the god force out there you know what about all these individual gods okay if you talk to my hindu friends they'll tell you there's 33 million gods but they tell you it's brahma right okay brahma so that's the god force and all the other aspects that are that we might venerate or look to for a particular aspect or be a patron of a particular thing all these God aspects are branches on the same tree of Brahma, that the great creative force. So we are carrying the God spark and the God sparks that are out there are up at the God levels. And the Buddhist community, community, we look at them as gods are just as messed up as we are, just in different ways. And that's another reason I don't call on the gods to do my magic because magic is physics. And how many people really do a prayer meeting when you're going to do an earth science experiment? Or you know, so, right. you know, that's that's the yeah. way I look at it. You know, and so I I treat magic as a completely separate thing. But I do veneration. And did you know the majority of witches are technical witches? They're not they're not god and goddess people. The vast majority of witches are. Uh, technical, they're they're spell they're spell oriented, that kind of thing, and a very tiny percentage of them. You've got a little Venn diagram here, uh, falls into the pagan community and the Wiccans, and it kind of overlaps there, and uh, that's that's uh, how they overlap. But uh, the vast majority of witches are more technically oriented and not into the god and goddess stuff, and that's where you hear people say. Uh, got it. Uh, you know how do, how does the term go? Oh, um, not all witches are Wiccan, okay, and not and not all pagans are witches. True. Okay, so that's the only recommendation I can give people is is that try and find, do a lot of reading. Uh, don't go out and try and find a book. I had somebody last a couple of weeks ago, I need the most comprehensive book on gods I can find out there. And I said, well, one, you're not going to find it on the Internet. Um, I've got a book out here on my shelf that's 20 years old. It's got 2,500 different names of gods in there. OK, uh, I've got another book on my shelf out here. It's got 1,500 Egyptian gods. OK, and it's a scholar book. It's not just written by some some hack at one of the uh, new age companies, you know, so it's. Um, that's what you have to do. You have to start going out and doing some research. We had a kid last night uh, at our circle, and he was fantastic. We, we, we are referring to him as our scholar in residence. He is a Ph.D. candidate in ancient religions from a regional university here. And he had never been to a circle. Boy, we blew his socks off last night. He was just, I'll be back, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And, well, uh, I have a question about your go ahead. circles, Go ahead. Too. Do, 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 do. Well, some friends of mine were actually attending a paranormal event out in California, and they were out in the desert or a desert town. But they did what they called just an energy circle. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends who had never experienced that was kind of overwhelmed and thought that it was so cool and really neat. And there were a lot of people there who cared very much for each other participating and i think that love always carries through 
Yep. When that energy is just so wonderful. When we met at a place in Tennessee and we're discussing that, the a couple of the same people were involved and wanted to do another energy circle. I was, I'm not really that open to sharing my energy in that situation and that environment mm-hmm. with people mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And so probably I was blocking it, but it felt very much unusual. Mm-hmm. It, but it didn't feel like the positivity that had been described to me. Right. <clears throat> so is there always that variation based on who is participating or yeah. their yeah. intent you, or something? You get, you get one, you get one, what I'm going to call one sour apple in the circle and it can change the entire flavor of the whole thing. Was I the sour apple? <laughs> no, not necessarily. Okay. On, uh, but you know, but no, you could be because of the, the the shielding you were doing, the blocking you were doing. Okay, but I think two things you need to keep in mind I, that I tell people is, for I, I know a number of people. I don't want to be in a circle with those people because you know I don't want to mix my energy with them. I said, honey, you're already in the same energy with them because you're part of the force. Right. You know, so big deal. Just get your personality and your e again, get your ego out of it. OK, now what you were talking about is not so much mixing your energy with theirs as much as being shielded. Right. OK, so, you know, and th- and that's OK. You, you should probably shouldn't have even been in the circle with it if you're going to do all the shielding like that. You know, well, I don't usually consciously shield. Mm-hmm. It's just more like a, if I'm now, uncomfortable. Sometimes when you go into a circle and you have the the most generous intentions to be in there, and if there is somebody else who's that sour element, your naturally your shields go up. Right. Okay. okay. So that might have happened as well. Uh, there's oh, there's always somebody who wants to go steal energy. Um, I, I, I want to say something about raising energy. I'm getting ready to write an article for my column in Wicca Magazine about this. I well, hear these. Can you pieces. tell me in just about three minutes? Yeah. Because we're at break. Okay. And we'll be right back. Okay. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but. Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hopson Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting.
You're listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am joined by Cheryl Acosta. We were going to do UFOlogy. The universe had a different plan. So we are talking about witchcraft and paganism and this beautiful temple that Cheryl has just opened. They had their their opening event was is last night, right? Yeah, so it's brand new. And now we have moved on with our discussion. So here we are. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Well, one thing, one one thing about the temple, we did a, we had a founding meeting back on the 19th of January and we had like 36 people show up at this rental space that we, that we arranged and, um, they showed up and, uh, we pitched to them what we're, what we're trying to do. And, uh, and basically said, you know, you can be alone or you can come to, uh, you know, up, uh, once we get up and rolling, we're going to have eight Sabbaths and 13 moons. That's 21 cool events to go to every year. And uh, when was the last time you got to go to something other than a once a year regional festival? And of course, most people's hands were up on that one. And right. I said, okay, so there you go. You know, we're going to give you some place to go on a regular basis. I came from DC where there was something I could go to almost every night of the week if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what broke my heart when I moved to Syracuse. I couldn't get invited to a circle for here for almost uh, four years. Um, oh, but we don't know you, so we can't invite you our stuff, you know. And it, that was so depressing. Uh, the, the, this, this particular area is so insular and very um, insular and closeted. Now, when we started this whole effort to start the Temple of Tara, Oh, we ruffled some feathers with some of the old guard families, too. The old guard craft families that, you know, uh, maybe we'll take one new student this year, you know. And I'm throwing open the door and saying, we'll take everyone. Yep. And it's 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 in their face. And, of course, they, they were predicting we would fall on our face. We had our founding meeting. We had almost 40 people show up. We planned our first ritual. We had... 40 people show up and guess what of the membership that already paid from that founding meeting only 13 of them actually could because of scheduling could actually attend the the vast two two thirds of the people who showed up last night were new people trying us out and about half of them actually signed the paperwork and became a subscribing member that is too neat (coughs) congratulations yes sorry for them too I did hit the cough switch there. Okay. It, it, and, it, and this is the deal. Now, are we going to start throwing moons right away? No, we're not. We're, we're, we, I just literally rented this, uh, rented the space for our Astara here in about, you know, five weeks, five, mm-hmm. six weeks. And yeah. I'm already talking to the high priest about, um, about Beltane. You know, we're looking out that far out because we have to be able to arrange uh, things and uh, we're trying to anticipate whether or not we will have a big enough place. The place we've got has a capacity of about 100 people. We had 40 people there last night and uh, we were already very, we were tight in some context. Now, I've had people say to me, well, what happens if this temple congregation grows to, remember, we're using, people think temple and they think I've got a building. no. I why you know, drive around the suburbs after dark. Most of the Christian churches you see out there in the suburbs are dark all week long, except maybe Wednesday night and definitely on the weekend. Okay, why do you want to pay heat and electricity and the and, and mortgage or the rent on the property? Okay, why do we want to do that? And the pagan community has a tendency to be very cheap anyway. So um, we we said let's do a tabernacle style. Uh, congregation. We will basically pack up and go to where we need. So right now we can handle about 70 to 80 people at the site we're using. And somebody said, well, what happens if we do a big thing and everybody really signs up and we need a place for like 200 people? I said, I got a dozen fire halls who are happy to rent to me. Okay. And we'll have 
we'll do it there. Well, what happens if we outgrow the fire hall? Oh, you mean like three, four hundred people join our temple and a lot of them show up for the big high holy days like Beltane and Samhain? And they said, yeah. I said, then uh, the the state fairgrounds are just down the road. I live on State Fair Boulevard. And if we get membership up that big, we'll have sufficient subscription money coming in. It's not a tie. We only charge, we charge $20 a month for regular memberships. We charge $15 a month for uh, senior and uh, disabled. Uh, we have a student rate of $5, but not voting. And we also have a patron rate for people who are like out of area, only come in seasonally during the warm season or whatever. And uh, for like five bucks a month, that's a happy meal guys, you know? And by the way, that $20 a month, that sounds to some people, Oh my God, $20 a month. That's $240 a year guys. That's four happy meals or four lattes a month. There but you you're going to you're going to get to go to some place where we have to do a pass a, a dish to pass kind of dinner and you get a circle and you get all that camaraderie with everybody for like we always build 90 minutes to two hours worth of social time after the rituals. And last night we had a sit down. You saw the pictures there. Sit down dinner with lovely tables and everything. And um, uh, the buzz this morning was amazing. You know, so uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the model of being able to get away from living room covens of 12 people and scale this up where everybody is welcome. Well, and the I tremendous support with the support with the GLBT community with this, this initial coven has been tremendous. I got 15 percent trans persons in this group, which is terrific. We're going to have a very interesting non-binary dialogue with the rest of the rest of the congregation. So I'm really excited about this. Well, that actually opens up a whole lot of different discussions. Yeah, it That's does. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> well, I had some Dianic witches uh, ask me this question. He says, well, you know, uh, what about the, 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 the gender benders here in the group? I said, yeah, we have something to teach you that you don't know. Okay. You think you know all the mysteries. We've got a set of mysteries that you know nothing about. And if and you that want, they couldn't possibly. Couldn't possibly know. And you have no idea the, 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 the five or six blessed guests we've got in this room right now that you should be kissing their feet, you know? And, and, and the, this one Diana Witch looked at me and she's very seasoned. She looked at me and said, you're kidding me. I said, no, I'm not. Remember a lot of native American tribes had a third gender element in their society. Okay. And when Cortez's people got here in the 1530s or whatever, they found this third gender thing and all they could do was equivalent to homosexuals back in, back in Europe and all in the spirit of the Inquisition, they exterminated them all. And what they found, what the conquistadors found was it demoralized the tribe that they had just done that to. So they started killing all the two souls persons in all these tribes that they encountered, provided they had uh, this third gender. Not all tribes have that, but majority of them did. And every place they went in the world, if they found this third gender component running in the tribe, they they, they killed them first. So that they and they found it demoralized the spirit, the the, the, the tribe, and they they did whatever they were going to do, push them into slavery most of the time. And uh, so you know. The, I people I've had I'm on the ministerial council here in town representing the temple. That's mm -hmm. a big coup. That's a big coup. That is a big okay. coup. I wear a clergy shirt, black clergy shirt, but I wear a bright green collar. We are I the saw temple. That. I love are, that bright green collar. We are, we are the temple of green tar, and we are also a temple representing Gaia, Mother Earth. So green was totally appropriate. Yeah. And in fact, our, our T-shirts are going to be very, very bright, phosphorescent green. But um, that's the deal. We're, we're reaching out. I sat down at the, the ministerial council, and when the people asked me, "Do you guys eat babies?" I said, "That's 15th century Catholic Church rhetoric." You, yeah. They do that. People do that when they want to demoralize the culture. They want to make war on. OK, no, we don't eat babies. OK, no, we they don't genuinely ask you that. Were they sincere? Oh, yeah. They were oh, sincere. Yeah. That was not a tongue in cheek question. No, it was not a tongue in cheek <gasps> question. 
I had another another uh, clergy person look at me and say, "I don't know about if we should have you on this council." Uh, oh do, do you people ha- do you people have a God? And, and we're we're talking about thirty ministers and imams and uh, that kind of thing there. And I said, "Yeah, we got them by the bushel." You know, like I said earlier, you know. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Hindu the Hindu priestess is over here across the, across from me in this uh, you know this kind of a U shaped uh, um, uh, table setup, you know. And she's looking over at me, putting her fist up, going. Yeah, you know, so you know, I said, guys, you keep trying to do the whole. Fr-. In fact, somebody asked me after we broke up the meeting. He says, "Well, you know, there's a, there's one God." I said, "There's one force in the universe," but uh, you guys, uh, you Abrahamic guys, seem to think that uh, Yahweh slant Jehovah is the only franchise in town. He said in the big in the Ten Commandments, uh, "I am thy Lord, thy God. I'll have no other gods before me." And that didn't say there weren't other gods. There's plenty of other gods, but you know, I, I've always been. I I do not knock the Abrahamic traditions, but I did have one clergy person come up to me and say, well, ours is a loving God. And I said, no, your, 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 your God has said it. And I started quoting, quoting the Bible. And it says, I'm a God of, I'm a God of war. I'm a God of wrath. I'm a God of jealousy. And I'm a God of this, you know, I says, you know, by any other standard, if, if Yalveh was, uh, um, uh, in our society, in a human form, he, he would have issues and he'd probably be in therapy. She'd be in therapy right now. Or court ordered therapy. If he says, "I'm a god of war," you know. Uh, oh boy, that went over like a ton of baloney. <laughs> well, I mean, I just can't believe. But it's the that truth. Someone you know. actually asked you that. Oh God, yeah. We did a poll uh, sometime rec- about six months ago, and uh, uh, of all the things that people ask pagans in the workplace and things like this, you know, your pinnacle meets you with the devil, you know, the, the, all that stuff, you know. Oh, I wear a black ring. Um, my wedding ring is the elf in love went uh, lo, um, Linda's and mine wedding ring is the elf in love ring okay we have gold versions of the gold band versions of this and um and that's from our hand fasting uh 15 15 years ago uh, we're legally married now but um uh, i was working around a lot of machinery a few years ago at a newspaper i work for in the technical department Linda, excuse me, my burp, sorry about that. Linda was um, concerned that I might damage the gold ring around, you know, the mechanical stuff. She mm-hmm. bought me a tungsten ring. It's the same elf and love ring, except it's black and, and the, the, the elfish is written on it, is, is laser etched into it, and it's made of tungsten. Uh, my sister, who used to, is a, used to be a jeweler, said, you know, if you ever have an injury, they're going to have to cut the finger off to get the ring off. That's true. You know, because this thing is indestructible and um, it's black. And I literally had now this is I literally had somebody say to me, oh, you've got a black ring on. Oh, you're married to Satan, aren't you? You know, and this, is, this is the kind of rhetoric that is out there. And, and well, no, she doesn't usually have those many bad days. So, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah, so my argument. Golly. Part of why am I doing that television? Why is my producer want to do this national television program? We want to change the narrative. Let me give you one more hook on that on that thing. I had a lady come from a call me up from a Los Angeles public relations place. And she says, I heard you guys are developing this program. I'm going, oh, she says, we're a public relations firm. I said, I don't have any money to hire you. She says, no, that's not the way this works. She says, we heard you doing this program. I said, yeah. He says, if you get signed, come to us because the networks don't normally do a good job of publicizing the programs. But if you come to us, we will go to their publicity department and say, subcontract it to us and we'll make sure the show gets lots of good visibility. And I said, okay, why are you doing this for a program about a lot of crazy yogis and mystics and, and witches, card-carrying witches? She says, honey, and this is the CEO of the company. I am Santeria. My mother and aunts are Santeria, and my sisters are Santeria, and we want to change the narrative too. Wow. So there's a bigger hand at work here, hon. <laughs> well, I told you. Things work the way they're supposed to. Yeah. And, you know, because look at us talking about this as opposed to numbers and visitations and all of that type thing, right? Can we talk about raising energy for a second? Absolutely. Okay. Um, we got a bit for, before our break here. We do. All right. I hear priestesses all the time. Oh, we were raising great energy. No, the energy's already there. 
Mm-hmm. We're con- we're connected via the force, right? I'm, again, I'm talking like Obi Wan Kenobi here. We're we're talking about the force. We're already wired into the force. Raising energy is not the issue. Is getting our mind quiet enough that we can communicate with nonverbal technique our intentions to the force. Okay. That's how magic works. That's what spells are about. Spells are designed. The incantation is useless. In fact, uh, you can always tell the, in a circle the ex-Catholics because they, they, they come in with long liturgies and verbiages and things like this. you know. But with spells, the intention of the spell, an ancient spell is not going to do you any good because you have no connection to the context of what that means. Give me an example. Uh, there's a spell out here that says you need a, a Negro's head. Well, if that spell was probably written back during colonial times, and what they're talking about is a type of wild cabbage. OK, and, and, and like the ter- term hen's teeth, you know, do hens have teeth? No, it's a certain type of it's a certain type of herb that looks like a hen's beak with teeth, you know. So the symbology is important. If in, in, Even if I were to tell you um, you need a dial telephone, a lot of kids right now wouldn't know what you were talking about. That's right. The okay? majority of them probably. Yeah, there, it, it's the, so. People tell me, oh, I've got this old spell book. It's useless to you. You don't have the con- the language context-, context context to understand what the visualization and the symbology is probably. You don't have that uh, without doing a lot of research. Okay, now let's go back for a minute with the idea of uh, – you can do – by the way, you can do better magic by learning American Sign Language than you can by getting spell books. Okay, trust me. Um People say, oh, we were raising great energy. No, you were not raising great energy. You were, you're out there chanting. You're dancing around the circle. You're raising endorphins. You've got yes. a, a chemical high. That is not raising energy. That is a chemical high, natural chemical high. You just raised your endorphins. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I'm spoiling it for some people, but yes, I love to go to a circle and have that endorphin high myself. I love doing that stuff, but... When I'm working magic, it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about quieting myself. It's about learning to visual, uh, training myself to visualize. And if you want to really learn magic, if you get Silver Raven books, uh, Silver Raven Wolf's book, Teen Witch, it'll give you the basics. But the other book you need to do or go sign up for locally, a good class in meditation. Learn to quiet yourself. Okay. Well, taming yeah, the mind. And, Yes, and, and mind people say it's a great book. Well, people tell me, yeah, Taping Mind is a very excellent book. And people say, well, meditation, anybody can do that. No, we're not talking no. guided, guided meditation. We're talking solitary meditation. If you think it's easy, understand. Try and get, close your eyes, turn your phone off, and, and, and turn on your alarm clock, give yourself uh, your kitchen alarm clock, and give yourself two minutes. Close your eyes and just be alone with your thoughts. And it will be the longest two minutes of your life. I tell my students, give me, I don't want 45 minutes. I don't want an hour of meditation. Heck, I lived in a monastery. Best I ever mastered was 45 minutes. And I was there for seven years. Lamas that do they can do it for days. They they learned how to do it when they were eight. Yeah. Okay. And they've been so, mastering it more strongly ever since. Give yourself two minutes a day. After about a month, if you can do consistently two minutes a day for a month, then give yourself two minutes in the morning, then give yourself two minutes in the evening for the second or third month, okay? That's how you evolve this thing. I would rather have two solid minutes of you quieting yourself than 45 minutes of struggling. Well, I would fall asleep if if I tried to go 45 minutes. Uh, You know what I do? I've been doing this, and I literally go about 12 minutes. I do about 15 minutes a day. I'm busy. I'm a busy... I mean, I'm retired, but I'm a working journalist. So... Mm -hmm. um, I I do about 15 minutes a day. I do five minutes in the morning before I really get going with stuff. I do about five minutes, just about light, right after lunchtime type of thing before I get into my afternoon routine. And then I do another five or seven minutes maybe after supper. Okay. That's what my routine is like. Little five-minute vacations during the day. And That's people say, exactly what? what they are. 
Oh, they you know don't, I don't have break. time. Oh, we're at break. We'll come back. We're at break. Meditate be... for two minutes during break. <laughs> That's right. And we will be right back. Thank you all for being here. And y'all come right back too. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio. This is our final segment. So if you have any questions, please get them into the chat rooms and we will get you answers. We have been discussing all kinds of wonderful things with Cheryl. And you know what? This has been a fantastic show thus far. <laughs> Thank you. This has been fun, yes. And it is definitely the universe changing the channel, as it were. <laughs> so you obviously had things to discuss and we had things to learn so it's a good thing yes. thank you for that my pleasure now you were talking about raising energy you were talking about meditation okay. you were talking about um taming your mind and being well, let's, able let's to go, achieve that let's go there with the meditation now the meditation thing is in fact i had somebody i taught a class of meditation up at one of the new one of the metaphysical stores and the guy said, well, I, I told him to go get a little like a $7 um, kitchen timer. You can get, you know, go over to Target. You can buy them for about six or so, four, anywhere between four and eight dollars. Just a little kitchen timer. Well, I can use my iPhone. I said, no, I want you to turn the iPhone off. OK, I don't want that mechanism buzzing you and bringing you out of it. Somebody texting you or something. You can't be anticipating when you do this. Um, and I had a, I had a little egg timer, uh, not an egg timer, but a little a kitchen timer. And I did two minutes with them and I showed them, you know, this, this two minutes is harder than you think. And one of the things that comes up out of your subconscious is all the troubles of the day. And this is what scares a lot of people away from it. Oh, I couldn't hang out. I couldn't do it because all this stuff is coming up in my mind. It happens to everybody. We call them, we call them psychic ghosts. It's not really a ghost, but it's, it's all the stuff that's in your subconscious and troubles and things. And that's, that's your thoughts. And that's and part of that. Them, it lets you release them though and acknowledge them. Yes. You have yes. to do that. Yes. And the trick is, is not to engage them. You release them by not engaging them. Don't give them any energy. Okay. Yep. And uh, over a period of a few months, you can minimize that. It's the initial students that had that trouble. And uh, it's about a little bit about breathing and everything. It's not about form, getting down in the lotus positions. If you can't get down in the lotus position and sit on a pillow or something, uh, heck, I, I'm an old lady. I'm 68 years old and I have another month or two. So uh, I sit in a chair, a regular kitchen chair 
or a, t- a dining room chair and I put my hands on my knees and I, I sit as erect as I can and I just close my eyes and I, I take deep breaths and gently blow them out for the two minutes. Okay, and this is about being alone with your thoughts. I've had people say, "Well, I don't have time to do it." I said, "Then do it on the on the toilet when you're at work. Don't take your phone in there and read your messages. Just go in there, and after you've done your business, take an extra two minutes and just quiet yourself and blow out a little bit and take a little two minute vacation." Okay, and that's how I tell people. Now, there, now for people who seriously want to learn this stuff, there's another approach. You can Google the Monroe Institute, the Monroe Institute. They have these uh, CDs called HemiSync. Now, the ter- technology behind this, and the Army used it very successfully in their remote viewing program many years ago. Imagine they pump white noise. You have to do this with stereo headphones. You can't do it. You can't do it with earbuds because it doesn't cover your your ears well enough. You put on a pair of stereo headphones and what the, you played a CD in this thing. They used to do it with just a cassette, you know, but the CDs are much better. And it, they pump white noise into your ear. Some of the white noise might sound like it's reggae uh, uh, rhythms or something like that. They pump this white noise in your ear. Sometimes it just sounds like a quiet static or a static hiss. But what they're also doing is they're putting like a tone in one ear as well, submerged in that white noise, like a 100 hertz tone in one ear and a 108 hertz tone in the other ear. And what happens is each hemisphere of the brain starts resonating with that, that tone that's being plugged into that ear. And what happens is... You end up with an 8 hertz beat between 100 and 108. You've got an 8 hertz beat between the hemispheres of your brain. That is alpha. And it can put you into an alpha state in about 5 to 10 minutes if it doesn't knock you you out and put you to sleep. Uh, So when I've trained my students, I had a headphone amplifier for um, like eight people, plug everybody into a bunch of cheap Radio Shack headphones. I laid them all down on the ground, set them down on a pillow, throw a light blanket on them and play it to them. And within about five minutes, most of them are snoring. Okay, it'll put them down. But if you work with it, uh, my llama listened to it. He said, wow, we work months trying to get people into the state that this thing puts you into in about 10 minutes. You know, this is great. You know, so it's a modern 21st century technology. It's the Monroe Institute. You can Google them. They've got Hemi, HemiSync technology. Don't Google HemiSync. You'll get stuff about high capa- high performance uh, truck engines. Uh, but if you. Yeah, you will believe me. So, <laughs> so go, go, go uh, look up like a neural sync or look up uh, the Monroe Institute. And it's the best place to buy one of their CDs. They're only about 15, 15 bucks or so. Get one of them and play with it. Do not play it in your car while you're driving. Truth. Okay, truth. You can, that's not a good thing. But uh, it, it doesn't Especially do much. Especially once good. you've conditioned yourself to it. Yeah, yeah. Because you just shouldn't you be react. doing it while you're while you're working, okay? Now, I got to the point when I started working with it where I was able to not fall asleep. And what you're trying to do is hover between your chattery conscious mind and falling asleep. There's this little band in there that if you are focusing your your concentration and your breathing and everything, you can maintain a level of consciousness without falling asleep. It's a, it, going into a dream state, that type of thing. You're hovering in that little space, and that takes work. But that's the place you want to be. Yes. And once you learn how to do it with the, the HemiSync technology, you can do it yourself. It took me many months. But once you – I had somebody – Bought the bought the CD, called me up. Well, I got the CD yesterday in the mail. I played it and listened to it. Now what? <laughs> you know, uh, no, this is a tool to develop develop yourself. So I, I, I recommend that strongly to learn how to quiet your mind. And once you start learning how to quiet your mind, then you've got the ability to visualize and pass nonverbal information through to the younger self, which connects to the great consciousness, which means you can manifest or you can do it the other way. You can use it for divining all the knowledge in the universe is available. If you quiet your chatter, all the knowledge of the universe is out there. And we call it the Kashic records and the new age community, but all of it's there. The best magic I've learned in, in the, the last 20 years of my life, I learned through that kind of, 
deep meditation and contemplation. It wasn't in a book. I didn't get a booming voice in my head, but I knew this stuff when I came out of these sessions. You know, I have always been curious about that because I have read several authors on the Akashic Records. And some people want you to think that it's impossible for the average bear to 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 get the information. It's not. It's no, not proprietary it to any individual. It is part of the universe and the energy force that is all of us. And if you learn how, you can do that, right? Yeah. Well, you know what I, I, I do with my students right now? Um, I, like I t- said I, earlier, I, I teach this um, – occasionally I teach this thing called basic and advanced magical physics, okay? And I, ch- I, t- I offer it dirt cheap. It's basically the cost of running the room and some handouts. So it works out to about $15, $20 a head you know, for an all – a four-hour class, okay? And um, one of the things I do about about an hour into the class – I go ahead and and say, okay, I'm going to teach you a very basic technique of remote viewing. I'm going to show you, you can touch something a thousand miles away and sit here and write down information about it. And they go, yeah. I said, no, you're reaching out and touching the non-local information or the Akashic records. All the knowledge in the universe is out there. I'm going to show you how to touch it. And as soon as I show them how to do it and they come out of this session and then we analyze their papers that they were writing the information down, remote viewing uses kind of a data mining kind of thing where I ask you questions while you're in the zone against a specific target. You don't know what the target is. You only know this is eight digit number or eight digit alphanumeric code. And they all had information about it. In fact, one of the ladies said, my God, I was there. You know, but you, you, but remote viewing isn't a big technicolor vision. Everybody thinks that remote viewing. Oh, there's a lot of BS out there on the internet. That says, oh, remote viewing is a big grand vision. No, it's not. It's like trying to see a cow through a bucket of mud. Okay, it really is. But once I've shown you, you can do this, and once you can touch things and harvest information from the stuff, that class, people came out and said, Cheryl, you. Every one, every person in that 15 person class I taught about a month ago said, would you teach an ongoing class on remote viewing? I said, yeah, I'll teach a, a once or twice a month class on remote viewing. And it isn't so much learning every single week. It is sometimes just coming in, working targets and de- get learning how to mine and getting yourself quieter. And it's a, I've had five different classes over the last 20 years and we've done some amazing stuff everybody's been to the moon everybody's been to mars uh, a couple of them uh, been to the island where Maria Earhart died you know we've uh, all this stuff they don't know they're going there i don't even know they're going there my wife gets her interns to stuff about 100 envelopes with target information I have no idea what they're stuffing in there and we have another intern who put, puts all the random numbers on the outside so it's double or triple blind by the time I get it to give to my students. I think that's pretty astounding because that is something that I have always thought would be very difficult. Yeah. So, until you I know, tried it. You know, I tell a lot of people, you know, the magic, if you truly are going to learn magic, um, don't settle for spells. I, I had somebody tell me, oh, you can't do magic like using remote viewing in reverse using the target cue to be your magical spell. Okay. And oh, you can, you got to know what the thing really is before you can concentrate the energy there. And I, and I told the guys, okay, go home or light some more candles and burn some more incense. You know, if you like, um, I'm talking about, these are new techniques that are not published out there in a book. Yeah. And I've had students, people, why aren't you writing the book on this stuff? I said, I did. I wrote one about 10 years ago. My, adult adept daughter read the book and told me I was, uh, I made magic so simple that my daughter adult, adult, and she's a very talented mage on her own. And she, uh, she trained with other people. I taught her the basics. Other people trained her on the advanced stuff. And she came to me and she read the manuscript. She says, you're handing out loaded shotguns to third graders. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So I put it on the shelf, came back about a year later, read it fresh, and I took it out in the backyard, put it on the grill, poured lighter fluid over it, and burned the whole damn thing. You know, <laughs> she was right. She was right. So now the only way you get it is you get it 
you get it orally from me and you take good notes. That's the that's, only way you're going to get it. That's pretty amazing. Now, and I've got people what? asking me to stream it, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> I would ask you to stream it. But we are at the end of our time. Boy, two hours flew so by, fun. didn't it? <laughs> it did. And, you know, I want to thank you because this is the side of you that I enjoy. I, I enjoy all of your work. Mm-hmm. But... This has been really interesting. Thank you. And I appreciate your willingness to share and to educate and to chat. It's just been fantastic. Anytime, and, anywhere, hon. Happy well, to do know it again. you I'm calling you back again. Okay. So, and everyone, you can find Cheryl. CherylCosta.com will get you, I know that will get you to the playwright mm-hmm. part two. So, um, and you really need to read those plays. They're, read they're the great. plays. You, you read the plays. If you read between the lines, you'll find out I'll, I'll, I've written a lot of mysticism into some pretty mundane plays. And they're great. They're great. And, you know, we will be back. Denise Pride Moore will be on tomorrow night with the Paranormal Pride. I will be back Wednesday with Paranormal Experience with Kat Hobson. We will have a rebroadcast on Friday of the Ghost Talk radio show. And if you missed it, it was fantastic. It was karma, destiny, and free will. And Shelly did a great job. So you need to listen to that. Yeah, it was awesome. But anyway, that being said, you know what? When you get out there, you're going to start a new week tomorrow. Everybody's in an uproar. The society is in an uproar. The globe is in an uproar. We have disease. We have politics. We have blah, 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 blah. Be that change you want to see. Thank you. You can manifest this. It's something we can all do. Visualize the world as you want it to be and just live in that world. And take care of you, too. Be the friend that you would like to have. It works. It makes life so much more peaceful and beautiful and you don't have to be a Pollyanna you just have to be true to you and that being said thank you all thank you Cheryl good night and we will catch you on the the next show it's going to be awesome good night You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Warning. The following message does not necessarily reflect the views of WBHMDB or its hosts, guests, listeners, or of any functioning adult in general. In fact, Frank should probably seek professional help. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, Frank Lee here. I thought that I would spend a few moments telling you about the positivity from the network here. Uh, The overall message of para unity and happiness and how everyone here wants to get along with everyone out there and how everything is just wonderful wait cat's not looking (laughs) okay i've got something to really tell you So I'm going to tell you what's really going on. Honestly, all that being nice and positive crap was kind of hurting my soul, as dark as it is. So, what's really happening? Well, you see it all the time. 
everybody in their brother out there has a paranormal team because they watch a couple of episodes of Ghost Hunters or some crap like that. So they go and they spend half their mortgage payment on tools and things that light up that they don't understand. And then the next logical step after buying matching black t-shirts and posing like 90s rappers for their Facebook page is to, of course, have their own podcast. Well, you know what? You're not going to find that crap here. What we have here at WBHM Digital Broadcasting is the best host, the best guest, bringing you real information. All of the hosts here on this network know their stuff. They are the people who have been out there doing the work, doing actual research. And no, by research, I don't mean binge-watching some kind of cheesy TV show on Netflix. I mean reading books. I mean out in the field doing the lay work. And who are they interviewing on their shows? They're bringing you the people they have learned from. They're bringing you the best in the field covering all kinds of topics from UFOs and aliens to Bigfoot to cryptozoology to ghosts to anything you can think of a bit strange and unexplained it is here and you're going to get the best information here so stay tuned to WPHM Digital Broadcasting don't go anywhere speaking of going somewhere I've got to go before my mic gets cut. We'll see you there on WBHM DB.